الحمد لله نحمده سبحانه ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا وعظيمنا وزعيمنا وحبيبنا محمدا صلى الله عليه وسلم قد بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في سبيل دينه حتى أتاه اليقين فاللهم اجزه عنا وعن والدينا وعن الإسلام والمسلمين خير ما جازيت به نبيا عن قومه ورسولا عن أمته اللهم أحينا على سنته وآمتنا على ملته واحشرنا تحت لوائه وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا من يده الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نظمأ بعدها أبدا اللهم أمين We're going to continue to cover the topic of good manners with Allah and today we are going to talk about the topic of what are the rights of Allah on his creation what does Allah have of rights on us we talk a lot about human rights and we ask Allah for any and all and everything we want thinking that he must oblige and do it now or yesterday so we need to ask this question what are the rights of Allah on his creation on us humans in the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim Mu'adh ibn Jabal was riding behind the Prophet Sallallahu and the Prophet Sallallahu called him out Mu'adh do you know what are the rights of Allah on one of us and Mu'adh says Allah wa rasooluhu a'lam Allah and his messenger know best so the Prophet Sallallahu says ay ya'buduhu فلا يشركوا به شيئا that they should worship him and never associate any partner or equate anyone to him so Mu'adh says one hour after the Prophet called him again Mu'adh do you know what the right of Allah is on one of us and he says Allah wa Rasuluhu A'lam Allah and his messenger know best then he repeated the same answer to worship him and never associate anyone or anything with him one hour later Mu'adh do you know what is the right of Allah on one of us he says Allah wa Rasulu A'lam Allah and his messenger know best then the Prophet Sallallahu says to worship him and never associate anyone with him one hour later Mu'adh, do you know what do they get if they do that? He says, Allah wa Rasuluhu A'lam. Allah and his messenger know best. Then he says that he would enter them into paradise. This is the contract we have with Allah. Ibn Mas'ud has another narration in his explanation of the ayah, وَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَلَا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا from Surah An-Nisa, worship Allah and associate none and nothing with him. He says that the right of Allah on his people are as follows, that he is always obeyed and never disobeyed. And yuta'a fala yu'sa. And that he is always remembered and never forgotten. وَأَنْ يُذْكَرَ فَلَا يُنْسَى and أَنْ يُشْكَرَ فَلَا يُكْفَرْ that he is always offered our uh, most sincere gratitude and he is never denied you look at this this is the contract we have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so Allah expects things of us and we should expect things of him Allah does what he promises without us waiting for him to give but he 
in his divine expectation of us, he allows us to be mistaken, to be wrong, so long as you come back. So you're allowed to make mistakes, but you're not allowed to forget Allah. Why? It is in your own best interest. It is in our best interest that we never forget Allah. So the warnings are spread throughout the Quran, coming from the time of Adam, that we have taken the covenant from Adam, but we found that he forgot and he was without resolve. He didn't have the resolve to hold on to what Allah promised him and what Allah forbade him from doing. Similar to his children, or his children are following on his footsteps. So Allah uses this to warn us, saying, وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ نَسُوا اللَّهَ فَأَنْسَاهُمْ أَنفُسَهُمْ Don't be like those who forgot Allah. أَيُّذْكَرَ فَلَا يُنْسَى Never forget Allah. So what does it mean to remember Allah? And what does it mean to forget Allah? To remember Allah means to remember His words. Well, that is still too general. We all say, of course we remember the Qur'an is the word of Allah. But Allah wants you to remember of His word what is relevant to your need at the moment. So when the Qur'an speaks about, for example, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا الزِّنَا Don't get near zina. You need to remember this ayah when your eyes start to look out. When you start to interact with the opposite gender. You need to watch yourself. But if you forget his word, you forgot Allah. So to remember Allah is to remember his commands. That is still too general. What is specific is to remember what is relevant to your situation. You, you're at work, you remember Ada al Amana, that you fulfill your duty honestly and fully and completely. You are helping someone, you do it in devotion to Allah. وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ in devotion and sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have to be careful because some of us understand or misunderstand dhikrullah to remember Allah as you say some words in the morning and you repeat them in the evening. Or you make dua when you need Allah. Those are part of it. But what Allah really expects of us is to remember Him in every turn. So here is what Allah says. Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu, udhkuru allaha dhikran, what? Kathira. Udhkuru allaha dhikran, kathira. Remember Allah a lot. In the battlefield, ya ayyuha alladheena amanu, إذا لقيتم الذين كفروا إذا لقيتم فئة فاثبتوا واذكروا الله كثيرا to remember Allah a lot a lot what is the limit there is no limit well unless there is time when you don't need him when you don't need him go worship the other gods but if you know, as a Muslim, that you need him in every second, then where is the allowance to forget Allah? And what happens when and if you forget Allah, you forget yourself? How do we actually forget ourselves? I know that it is in my best interest to do certain things at certain times. But sometimes, do I forget it? Right? Do I miss my interest? Right? Do I squander opportunities? I do. Do I oversleep? I do. Right? That means what? That if I am falling in this 
vicious cycle and trap that I'm forgetting a lot, ask yourself, do you remember Allah and forget your things? No. If you remember Allah, you don't forget what is important for you. But if you forget Allah, you will forget your interest, what is good for you. So Allah says, اذكروا الله ذكرا كثيرا. Definitely, many of us still understand that dhikr is to say words of praise and glorification to Allah. And definitely, that is a form of praise. But good manners require that we praise Allah whether it is a dua for something we need or it is just praise for His Majesty or praise. Uh, just praise for his gifts and his bounties and what he has given me. So I should never look at Allah with an opportunist's eye that I only want to use his power or his bounties when I need it. And when I think I do not need him, I forget him. What happens when you forget Allah is that you get the shaitan to remind you of other gods. The shaitan then makes you busy. A problem with your family, a problem in your work. Then you become depressed, you become overoccupied and busy and sad and sorry and uncomfortable because life becomes tight. It becomes tight. What does the Quran say about this tightness? The Quran says that your chest will be tight as if you are thrown from high. وَمَن يَكْفُرْ بِاللَّهِ فَكَأَنَّمَا خَرَّ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ فَتَخْطَفُهُ الطَّيْرِ فَتَهْوِي بِهِ الرِّيحُ فِي مَكَانٍ سَحِيقٍ It is like falling from high. You feel no grounds. You feel imbalance. You feel out of control over your life and your needs. And you feel very weak and helpless in front of people, in front of challenges, in front of problems. Things become tight. The Quran also describes the same thing in Surah Taha. He who turns away from my reminders and remembrance. فَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكَ He who turns away from my reminders and my remembrance, he leads a miserable life, a tight life. So your way out of any problem is to remember Allah. Because when you remember Allah and you are in a tight situation, what do you mostly remember? His punishment or his mercy? His gifts or the things he took away from you? It depends. If you are a grateful servant, follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. In the most tight of times, he always goes first for the praise of Allah and how much he has been uh, merciful to him. And then he may or may not ask for a direct something he needs. Most of the time he leaves it up to Allah. I know that your relief and your support and your help is greater for me. But he prefaces this dua in this way by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma anta rabbi, la ilaha illa ant. أنت رب المستضعفين وأنت ربي إلى من تكلني يا أرحم الراحمين أو الله You are the most merciful إلى من تكلني Whom are you leaving up to? Praise, 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 praise and then at the end he says اللهم إن لم يكن بك علي غضب فلا أبالي أو الله You know what I know so he doesn't go into explaining things because he knows that he's talking to Al-Alim Al-Hakim Al-Sami' Al-Basir. He's talking to Allah who knows everything and he has 
full control over everything. So he submits completely. And then he says, if you are not angry with me, nothing bothers me. I don't care what happens. My heels are bleeding. People are throwing stones at me. People are rejecting the message you sent me with. They are treating me as despised, as an enemy. I'm bringing them mercy from you. But still, if you are not allowing this as a punishment for me, I'm okay. So long as this is not punishment. So his fear is from his own mistakes. He's afraid he might have done something that Allah is trying to draw his attention. <coughs> so the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to worship him and never associate anyone with him. And as we mentioned before, we Muslims believe that not worshiping an idol, we're done with shirk, we have nothing to do with shirk. But we need to remember that shirk is as hidden as a black grain of whatever under a solid stone or inside a solid stone that you could never detect. Shirk is embedded in the human brain and in the human heart that you, in your commitment to Allah, you start off with negating shirk. La ilaha. That's negation. Illa Allah. That is affirmation. So it starts with negation because you have to get rid of shirk first. Shirk as a feeling. Shirk as belief. Shirk as action. And to be careful that you submit to Allah. La ilaha illa Allah. And this is where we have a problem. When we think that shirk is only worshipping a stone idol. As if worshipping myself is not shirk. As if when I love someone or something in competition with my love to Allah, that this is not shirk. It is shirk. It is shirk. And we've gone over this before, but I still find that we still need to rehammer this issue, the issue of self-worship. The Quran speaks to this in Surah Al-Jathiyah, where Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says, أَفَرَأَيْتَ مَنِ اتَّخَذَ إِلَاهَهُ <coughs> Have you seen to the one who has taken his whims and desires as his God? This country, the culture in this country, focuses on self-worship as self-preservation, as a survival mechanism. If you don't inflate your ego, people will eat you up. If you don't push back before anything threatens you, you will be taken flat on the floor. But that is not the way it should be. The way it should be that you give peace to people you know and people you don't. And give peace doesn't mean to say peace, but to give actual peace. To let people around you live safe, secure, and comfortable. Then they reciprocate, they return favor and they treat you equally the same or even better. So your way to safety is not by egocentrism, <coughs> that you worship yourself and you want everybody around you to worship you, to praise you. So if, you, if they don't praise you, you're never satisfied. That ego is what is being worshipped other than Allah. I'm worshipping my ego. And it gets in the way of peace between you and all and everyone around you, including, unfortunately, the closest people to you, your family, your children, your spouses, and people that rely on you the most. So we have to be careful that when Allah says, وَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَلَا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا He is not talking only about 
worshipping a stone as shirk. He's talking about directing your obedience to anyone other than Allah. Except for the people that Allah told you that you must obey. But even those like parents, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِن جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُشْرِكَ بِي مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا If they pressure you, if they pressure you to worship anyone other than Allah, never obey them in that item. But, وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا You may be a new Muslim, and you are struggling with your family. They may want to pull you back to worship the cross, or worship Isa, or worship Maryam, or worship any other thing. Allah says, don't obey them, but give them your best company. وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا This is the way it should be. The Quran teaches us to be objective in our relationship. We are very subjective. We personalize everything, including Islam, by calling the Quran our book. It is not your book. It is the book of Allah. And he has sent it down for everybody, not only for you. So why do you call it our book? Why do you call, it, why do you call the Prophet our Prophet? As if he is a property, a position to have. He is a Prophet for everybody. So we have to be careful. We have to be careful not to forget Allah and not to associate anyone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yuta'a fala yu'asa To obey Allah and never disobey Allah. We also have a problem with this. We obey Allah when we find it either easy, comfortable, or pleasant. Or when we sense it will give us our right. So let us go to the Shaykh and take a judgment. Why? Because the Shaykh is likely to give me my right. Right? But when I know that a court judge may give me a bit more, let's go to the judge. Let's go to the law. The law is neutral. But we choose the Shaykh or Islam, not that the Shaykh is Islam, but a reference, based on our expectation. So we are sometimes acting like what the Quran describes the behavior of the munafiqeen. The munafiqeen, the Quran says, and when they are invited to Allah and to his messenger, they turn their heads away. The Quran raises questions. Are they concerned that Allah and or his messenger would do them injustice? And if they have what they think they have the right judgment, then they come to the Prophet in submission. Oh, Prophet Muhammad, you are the fair judge, just tell us what to do. This is the behavior of the munafiqeen. We Muslims should love the rule of Allah, whether it is for me or against me. I should accept it. And I should be fair even to my enemy. Don't be driven by your animosity towards any community or any people, lest you do injustice to them. The ayah continues. Do justice. Is closer to piety. So the behavior of the Muslim is to obey and submit whether it is for you or against you. Again, the issue of convenience, which is part of self-worship. When somebody says, you know, why don't you come to Friday prayer? Do you know what? That's my lunch time. So I barely take a sandwich and go back to the office. So I don't have time. Well, come and take some benefit more than your sandwich. So when we do not dedicate a time for Allah, what are we saying to ourselves? Allah is telling us in Surah Al-Jumu'ah, إِذَا نُودِيَ لِلصَّلَاةِ مِنْ يَوْمِ الْجُمُعَةِ فَاسْعَوْا إِلَىٰ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Walk fast to catch up because what you may miss may be more important than anything else. And then Allah tells us, وَذَرُوا الْبَيْعَ 
leave your business. Leave your business. So he deliberately wants us to leave our business. And at the end of the ayah, he says, Wallahu khayru raziqeen. Allah is the best of providers. So why are you concerned about your risk? Don't you trust Allah's promise? But the problem is, when we sign a contract, and we never mention that we will need two hours or one and a half hour to go pray Jum'ah and come back, because the job is lucrative, or I'm afraid that I may not get the job if I ask for my religious right under the law, then I will be accepted. But no, the opportunity is yours only if Allah makes it yours, not if you give up what is essential in your faith. So we do the wrong calculations and then say, I'm sorry, I cannot come. I cannot make it to prayer. I cannot make it. What do we do to ourselves? In the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says, if someone does not pray Friday once, then a black spot will be on his heart. His heart. Then if he doesn't do for the second week, another spot. For the third week, another spot. For the fourth week, his whole heart will be covered with something like tar. You know what tar is? It is a material used for asphalt. It's dark and it's bad. So who could risk having his heart covered with tar? The Quran says, كَلَّا بَلْ رَانَ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ it, it set a black cover over their heart. And that prevents you from seeing things. Seeing not as with your eyes, but with your insight, which is more important. So we have to ask ourselves, when we forget Allah, and because we are busy, I told you that story before. A young man came to marry. And when I met him, I ask, and I normally do ask these questions. Brother, do you pray? He says, no. I said, what stops you from praying? He says, I work like 10, 12 hours a day. I said, okay. So, because you're busy working, you're not able to pray? He says, yes. And he's very confident and logical with himself. Very polite person. And I said, brother, do you know what you're telling Allah? He says, what? I told him, you're telling Allah, so long as you give me an opportunity to work, <laughs> I'm not going to pray to you. <laughs> you have to put me out of business. <laughs> That's what you're saying. Not with your tongue, but with your action. Remember, Allah looks at your actions more than he looks at what you say. What you say could be a claim. I am a Muslim, I love you, oh Allah, oh Allah, you are great, oh Allah, thank you. All of these words are empty words until you turn them into action. Listen to this. Allah tells Prophet Dawood, اعملوا آل داود شكرا O oh, uh, family of David, work your gratitude in action. <laughs> action speaks louder than words, right? So if this is true for us, that also is true for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for Allah to accept you, you have to match your actions with your words. And to be obeyed and never disobeyed. Many times when we are under pressure, we re resort and obey our whims more than we obey Allah. And ask yourself, when you become angry, do you obey Allah or do you obey your shaitan of anger? We obey the shaitan of anger. And then later on we remember and say, oh, I was angry. I'm sorry, brother. Allah wants us to remember him so that we are safe, so that we are accepted by others. So, that, so all what you need from others, you could have it by relating to Allah the way you should. 
and you don't have to show off. You don't have to pay them off. You don't have to do anything abnormal. But when you want to please people at the expense of displeasing Allah, they will never be happy with you. من طلب رضا الناس في سخط الله سخط الله عليه وأسخط عليه الناس. If you seek to please anyone in displeasing Allah, Allah will not be pleased with you and he will make people angry with you. Your family will be against you, your friends will be against you, your co-workers will be against you, your children could also turn against you. So you have to work with Allah. Let your relationship with Allah fix all other relations by putting Allah first. This is what it means to love Allah more than all else. And never to give the kind of love that is deserving only to Allah, never give it to anyone else. I will repeat this again. The type of love that is deserving only to Allah, never give it to anyone else. What is the kind of love deserving to Allah? Allah calls it Hubbillah. وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَتَّخِذُ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنْدَادًا يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ So there is, there is such a thing as the love of Allah that should never be given to anyone other than Allah. What is the love of Allah? The love of Allah is absolute. It is not relevant. You don't only love Allah when He gives you, and then you turn on your heels and give Him your back when you don't get what you want. He may not give you what you want because it may not be in your best interest. Remember, He is Allah, and you are one of trillions of his creations over the ages. I was making sujood today at Fajr, and I looked and there was a very minute speck on the carpet. And I was saying to myself, how small are we? How insignificant we are in comparison, if there is such a thing, to compare yourself to your creator? There is no way you could even do that. How dare anyone could do that? But when it comes to being his creatures, he created us. We are very, very, very insignificant. Don't inflate yourself. When you talk about Allah, never say if or but. Don't condition Allah. Your love of Allah should be absolute and it should also be unconditional. You can't condition Allah. You can say, if Allah gives me this, I will do that. Don't do that. This is a business type interaction between people. But with Allah, count what He gave you. Offer gratitude for that, and He promised to give you more. So you don't need to condition Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has already offered you so much. And He says, لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ وَأَنْ يُشْكَرَ فَلَا يُكْفَرَ Allah opened gates for you. If you don't appreciate what He already gave you, why do you want Him to believe you that you will be grateful if? It doesn't work this way. You should be grateful for what He has already given and He promised. If you believe His promise that He will give you more, then you will be grateful all the time. And sometimes, even in our gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are grateful for things that we think we need or want. But we take what we have for granted. And that's why we forget to thank Allah for our eyes, for our hearing, for our hands, for our fingers, for our legs, for the energy Allah gives us, for the air we breathe, for the food we eat, for the good friends Allah surrounds us with, for a good spouse, for a nice good child. We forget that those things are the foundation 
for our stability, our balance, our happiness. So we end up abusing what Allah gave us by taking it for granted and then asking him for other things that we don't have. And people who seek to get what they don't have while they forget to be grateful for what they have, they will never be happy even if they get all what they have. If you don't appreciate what you have, even if Allah gave you all and everything you ask for, you will never be grateful for that if you were not grateful for what you already have. If you take any blessings for granted, rest assured Allah will take it away from you and he will test you in it. And you may not like the test. So we have to be careful. Our relationship with Allah is governed by his rights on us then we have to be humble enough to understand that when it comes to our rights, they have already been delivered. He created us. And for us, he created heavens and earth and subjected everything there is in heaven and in the earth for us, for our utility. So how is it that we are asking for the universe and not being grateful for what we already have. So we're acting like children. Children, you give them one toy, they take it and play. They don't even tell you thank you until mom or dad says thank you to your uncle or something, right? Then they say thank you and they go to play, right? And then a few minutes, they are bored. So uncle, can you give me that other one? Can you give me this? So we're acting like children. We don't offer thanks for what we get. And when we get it, we are busy playing with it and not offer thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we are bored or when we are finished or when we take it for granted and decide we need something different, then we are begging for something different. That is childish. Muslims should now start thinking like adults. Grown-up adults, they do, then they ask. They do their duty and then they ask. If you work for a company and you are not doing your duty, you don't dare ask for a raise or promotion. But you ask Allah because you take Allah for granted. By the way, it doesn't bother Allah what you do. You cannot change his mood. You cannot change his position. He is not a human being. He is Allah. He is sovereign. He is exalted. He is Aziz. You cannot influence him, neither by pressure or by temptation or by anything. There are no strings you can pull on Allah. No strings you can pull. The only thing is you submit, you become grateful, and then the answer comes. What are the rights of people on Allah if they deliver his rights to him? The Prophet ﷺ says, to enter them into paradise. May Allah enter us into paradise. Alhamdulillah wa kafa wa salat wa salam ala ibadi alladhi nastafa wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lah وأشهد أن سيدنا ولنا محمد عبد ورسول وبعد. so this contract that we have between us and Allah is our way forward. it is the path through which we reach to Allah سبحانه وتعالى. so the only way to influence how Allah treats you is by changing the way you treat Him. And to change the way you treat him, you have to change the way you live, the way you pray, the way you ask Allah, the way you are grateful to him, the, the, the weight that you give to his word, and the value that you give to his judgment, and the appreciation you have for his guidance, and how you put all of this to practice in your life, so that you then will have reached where Allah wants you to be. Where does Allah wants us to be? قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ 
وممات لله رب العالمين لا شريك له وبذلك أمرت وأنا أول المسلمين Say O Muhammad عليه الصلاة والسلام My prayer and my sacrifice My living and my dying Are fully dedicated and devoted to Allah Which means nothing influences me but Allah Nothing comes as a motive for my behavior except Allah Nothing stops me from anything but Allah so Allah, for me, becomes what He says He is. Al-awwal wal-akhir, wal-zahir wal-batin. Allah is the first and the last. The first to consider, and the last that I will go to. My return is to Allah. Lillahi Rabbil Alameen. La sharika lah. There is no equals, there are no partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَبِذَلِكَ أُمِرْتِ This is not a, a choice. No, it is a command that you dedicate your life, your living, and your dying. Don't die except in the path of Allah. Die not except as Muslims. وَلَا تَمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ so brothers and sisters, let us revive our faith by rededicating our life and the way we live only to Allah. This dedication is past due. Our ummah needs you, your family needs you, your community needs you, your nation needs you, humanity needs you, and if you ignore you, then there is no you. You have no value. What is your mission in this life? Your mission is to save yourself and your family from hellfire. And that family extends to include the family of humanity. They are all yours to take care of. With your mercy, with your peace, with your love, with your care, with your teaching, with your role model. That is how we become real Muslims. Not convenience Muslim not pleasurable Muslim, but Muslims who live and die to execute the will of Allah. When you become an executor of the will of Allah, so Allah gives you His will, not in the human sense, but His admonishment, His wasiyya. What is His wasiyya? To live and die as a Muslim. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the life of the Muslim and never take our soul except as Muslims. Allahumma ahdina fi man hadayt wa aafina fi man aafayt wa tawallana fi man tawallayt wa qina wa asrif anna sharra ma qadayt Allahumma aqsim lana min khashyatika ma tahulu bihi baynana wa bayna maasiyatik wa min taatika ma tubalighuna bihi jannatak wa min aliyakin ma tuhawunu bihi alayna masaib al-dunya wa matta'na Allahumma bi asma'ina wa abusarina وقوتنا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا وإذا أردت بقومنا فتنة فنجنا منها يا مولانا غير خزايا ولا مفتونين ولا مبدلين ولا مغيرين اللهم لا تدع لنا في يومنا هذا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا دينا إلا قضيته ولا ضالا إلا هديته ولا غائبا إلا رددته ولا سائلا إلا أعطيته ولا مريضا إلا شفيته ولا ميتا إلا رحمته ولا مجاهدا إلا نصرته ولا طاغية ولا جبارا إلا قصمته اللهم عليك بالجبارين اللهم عليك بالجبارين اللهم عليك بالطغاة المعتدين فإنهم لا يعجزونك أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم فستذكرون ما أقول لكم وأفوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بصير بالعباد وأقم الصلاة